Chapter 7 of The Line of St. Mark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Isha. The Line of St. Mark, a story of Venice in the 14th century by G. A. Henty. Chapter 7 On Board a Traitor. Have you heard the news, Francisco? My cousins are rescued. I have been out this morning, and have only just heard it, and I was on the point of starting to tell you. Your news is old, Matteo. I knew it hours ago. And I hear, Matteo went on, that Polani found them in a hut on San Nicolo. My father cannot think how he came to hear of their hiding place. He says Polani would not say how he learned the news. My father supposes he heard it from some member of Ruggiero's household. Francis hesitated for a moment. He had at first been on the point of telling Matteo of the share he had had in the recovery of the girls. But he, he thought that, although his friend could be trusted not to repeat the news willfully, he might accidentally say something which would lead to the fact being known, and that as Polani had strongly enjoined the necessity of keeping the secret, and had himself declined to mention even to the council the source from which he obtained his information, that he would look upon him as a babbler, and unworthy of trust, did he find that Matteo had been let into the secret. It does not much matter who it is Polani learned the news from. The great point is he has found his daughter safe from all injury, and I hear has brought back with him the woman who betrayed them. It is fortunate indeed that he took such prompt measures with Ruggiero, and thus prevented him from escaping from the mainland and making off for the girls as, of course, he intended to do. My father tells me, Matteo said, that a state gondola has already been dispatched to bring Ruggiero a prisoner here, and that even his powerful connections will not save him from severe punishment, for public indignation is so great at the attempt that his friends will not venture to plead on his behalf. And now I have my bit of news to tell you, Matteo. Signor Polani has most generously offered me a position in his house, and I am to sail tomorrow in one of his ships for the east. I congratulate you, Francisco, for I know from what you have often said, that you would like this much better than going back to England. But it seems very sudden. You did not know anything about it yesterday, and how you are going to start at once. Why? When can it have been settled? Polani has been absent since daybreak, engaged in this matter of the girls, and has been occupied ever since with the council. I have seen him since he returned, Francis replied, and though it was only absolutely settled this morning, he has had several interviews with my father on the subject. I believe he and my father thought that it was better to get me away as soon as possible, as Ruggiero's friends may put down the disgrace which has befallen him to my interference in his first attempt to carry off the girls. Well, I think you are a lucky fellow anyhow, Francisco, and I hope that I may soon be doing something also. I shall speak to my father about it, and ask him to get Polani to let me take some voyages in his vessels, so that I may be fit to become an officer in one of the state galleys as soon as I am of age. Where are you going now? I am going round to the school of arms to say good-bye to our comrades. After that, I am going to Signor Polani's to pay my respects to the signoras, and I shall be at home with my father till it is time to go on board. He will have left here before I return for my voyage, as he is going to wind up his affairs at once and return to England. Well, I will accompany you to the school and to my cousins, Matteo said. I shall miss you terribly here, and shall certainly do all I can to follow your example and get afloat. You may have all sorts of adventures, for we shall certainly be at war with Genoa before many weeks are over, and you will have to keep a sharp lookout for their war galleys. Polani's ships are prizes worth taking, and you may have the chance of seeing the inside of a Genoese prison before you return. After a visit to the School of Arms, the two friends were rowed to Signor Polani's. The merchant himself was out, but they were at once shown up to the room where the girls were sitting. "'My dear cousins,' Matteo said as he entered, "'I am delighted to see you back safe and well. "'All Venice is talking of your return. "'You are the heroines of the day. "'You do not know what an excitement there has been over your adventure. "'The sooner people get to talk about something else, the better, Matteo,' Maria said. "'For we shall have to be prisoners all day till something else occupies their attention. "'We have not the least desire to be pointed at whenever we go out, "'as the maidens who are carried away.' If the Venetians were so interested in us, they had much better have set about discovering where we were hidden away before. 
But everyone did try, I can assure you, Maria. Every place has been ransacked, high and low. Every gondolier has been questioned and cross-questioned as to his doings on that day. Every fishing village has been visited. Never was such a search, I do believe. But who could have thought of your being hidden away all the time at San Nicolo? As for me, I've spent most of my time in a gondola, going out and staring up at every house I passed in hopes of seeing a handkerchief wave from a casement. And so has Francisco. He has been just as busy in the search as anyone, I can assure you. Francisco is different, Maria said, not observing the signs Francis was making for her to be silent. Francisco has got eyes in his head and a brain in his skull, which is more, it seems, than any of the Venetians have. And had he not brought farther to our hiding place, there we should have remained until Roggiero Montenegro came and carried us away. Francisco brought your father the news? Matteo exclaimed in astonishment. Why? Was it he who found you out after all? Did you not know that, Matteo? Of course it was Francisco. As I told you, he has got brains. If it had not been for him, we should certainly never have been rescued. Julia and I owe him everything, don't we, Julia? Forgive me for not telling you, Matteo, Francis said to his astonished friend, but Signor Polani and my father both impressed upon me so strongly that I should keep silent as to my share in the business, that I thought it better not even to mention it to you at present. It was purely the result of an accident. It was nothing of the sort, Maria said. It was the result of your keeping your eyes open and knowing how to put two and two together. I did not know, Francisco, that it was a secret. We have not seen our father since we have returned. I suppose he thought we should see nobody until he saw us again and so did not tell us that we were not to mention your name in the affair. But we will be more careful in future. But how was it, Francisco? Matteo asked. Now I know so much as this, I suppose I can be told the rest. I can understand well enough why it was to be kept a secret, and why my cousin is anxious to get you out of Venice at once. Francis related the manner in which he first became acquainted with the existence of the hut on the island, and the fact of its being frequented by Ruggiero Monsenego, and how, on catching sight of the governante in a gondola, and seeing her make out across the lagoons, the idea struck him that the girls were confined in the hut. It was all very simple, you see, Matteo, he concluded. I will never say anything against learning to row a gondola in the future, Matteo said, for it seems to lead to all sorts of adventures, and unless you could have rowed well, you would never have got back to tell the story. But it is certain that it is a good thing you were leaving Venice for a time, for Ruggiero's friends may find out the share you had in it from some of my cousin's servants. You may be sure that they will do their best to discover how he came to be informed of the hiding place, and he is quite right to send you off at once. What? Are you going away, Francisco? The two girls exclaimed together. I am sailing tomorrow in one of your father's ships, Signoras. And you are not coming back again? Marie exclaimed. I hope to have the pleasure of seeing you again, before very long, Signora. I am entering your father's service for good and shall be backwards and forwards to Venice as the ship comes and goes. My father is returning to England, and Signor Polani has most kindly requested me to make my home with him whenever I am in port. That is better, Maria said. We should have a pretty quarrel with Papa if he had let you go away altogether, after what you have done for us, shouldn't we, Julia? But Julia had walked away to the window, and did not seem to hear the question. That will be very pleasant, Maria went on, for you will be back every two or three months, and I shall take good care that Papa does not send the ship off in a hurry again. It will be almost as good as having a brother, and I look upon you almost as brother now, Francisco, and very good brother too. I don't think that man will molest us any more. If I thought there was any chance of it, I should ask Papa to keep you for a time, because I should feel confident that you would manage to protect us somehow. I do not think there is the slightest chance of more trouble from him, Francis said, for he is sure of a long-term imprisonment for carrying you off. That is the least they can do to him, I should think, Maria said indignantly. I certainly shall not feel comfortable while he is at large. After half an hour's talk, Francis and his friend took their leave. 
you certainly were born with a silver spoon in your mouth teo said as they took their seats in the gondola my cousin does well to get you out of venice at once for i can tell you there are scores of young fellows who would feel jealous at your position with my cousins nonsense francis said coloring how can you talk so absurdly matteo i am only a boy and it will be years before i could think of marriage besides your cousins are said to be the richest heiresses in venice and it is not because i have been able to be of some slight service to them that i should venture to think of either of them in that way we shall see matteo laughed maria is a little too old for you i grant but julia will do very well and as you have already come as maria says to be looked upon by them as a brother and protector there is no saying as to how she may regard you in another two or three years the thing is absurd matteo francis said impatiently do not talk such nonsense any more matteo lay back in his seat and whistled i will say no more about it at present francisco he said after a pause but i must own that i should be well content to stand as high in the good graces of my pretty cousins as you do the next morning francis spent some time with his father talking over future arrangements i have no doubt that i shall see you sometimes francis for polani will be sure to give you an opportunity of making a trip to england from time to time in one of his ships trading thither unless anything unexpected happens your future appears assured polani tells me he shall always regard you in the light of a son and i have no fear of your doing anything to cause him to forfeit his good opinion of you do not be over adventurous for even in a merchant ship there are many perils to be met with pirates swarm in the mediterranean in spite of the efforts of venice to suppress them and when war is going on both venice and genoa send out numbers of ships whose doings savour strongly of piracy remember that the first duty of the captain of a merchant ship is to save his vessel and cargo and that he should not think of fighting unless he sees no other method of escape open to him it is possible that after a time i may send one of your brothers out here but that will depend upon what i find of their disposition when i get home for it will be worse than useless to send a lad of a headstrong disposition out to the care of one but a few years older than himself but this we can talk about when you come over to england and we see what position you are occupying here i fear that venice is about to enter upon a period of great difficulty and danger there can be little doubt that genoa padua and hungary are leagued against her and powerful as she is and great as are her resources they will be taxed to the utmost to carry her through the dangers that threaten her however i have faith in her future and believe that she will weather the storm as she has done many that have preceded it venice has the rare virtue of endurance the greatest dangers the most disastrous defeats fail to shake her courage and only arouse her to greater efforts in this respect she is in the greatest contrast to her rival genoa who always loses heart the moment the tide turns against her no doubt this is due in no slight extent to her oligarchic form of government the people see the nobles who rule them calm and self-possessed however great the danger and remain confident and tranquil while in genoa each misfortune is a signal for a struggle between contending factions the occasion is seized to throw blame and contumely upon those in power and the people give way to alternate outbursts of rage and depression i do not say there are no faults in the government of venice but taking her altogether there is no government in europe to compare with it during the last three hundred years the history of every other city in italy i may say of every other nation in europe is one long record of intestine struggle and bloodshed while in venice there has not been a single popular tumult worthy of the name it is to the strength the firmness and the moderation of her government that venice owes her advancement the respect in which she is held among nations as much as to the commercial industry of her people she alone among nations could for years have withstood the interdict of the pope or the misfortunes that have sometimes fallen her she alone has never felt the foot of the invader or bent her neck beneath a foreign yoke to preserve her existence 
here save only in matters of government all opinions are free strangers of all nationalities are welcome tis a grand city and a grand people francis and though i shall be glad to return to england i cannot but feel regret at leaving it and now my boy it is time to be going off to your ship for lonny said she would sail at ten o'clock it is now nine and it will take you half an hour to get there i am glad to hear that giuseppe is going with you the lad is faithful and attached to you and may be of service your trunk has already been sent on board so let us be going on arriving at the ship which was lying in the port of malamocco they found that she was just ready for sailing the last bales of goods were being hoisted on board and the sailors were preparing to loosen the sails the bonito was a large vessel built for stowage rather than speed she carried two masts with large square sails and before the wind would probably proceed at a fair rate but the art of sailing close hauled was then unknown and in the event of the wind being unfavourable she would be forced either to anchor or depend upon her oars of which she rowed fifteen on either side as they mounted on to the deck they were greeted by polani himself i have come off to see the last of your son messer hammond and make sure that my orders for his comfort have been carried out captain corpadio this is the young gentleman of whom i have spoken to you and who is to be treated in all respects as if he were my son you will instruct him in all matters connected with the navigation of the ship as well as in the mercantile portion of the business the best methods of buying and selling the prices of goods and the methods of payment this is your cabin francisco he opened the door of a roomy cabin in the poop of the ship it was fitted up with every luxury thank you very much indeed signor polani francis said the only fault is that it is too comfortable i would as lief have roughed it as the other aspirants have to do there is no occasion francisco when there is rough work to be done you will i have no doubt do it but as you are going to be a trader and not a sailor there was no occasion that you should do so more than necessary you will learn to command a ship just as well as if you began by dipping your hands in tar and it is well that you should learn to do this for unless a man can sell a vessel himself he is not well qualified to judge the merits of men he appoints to be captains but you must remember that you are going as a representative of my house and must therefore travel in accordance with that condition you will be sorry to hear that bad news has just been received from the mainland the state galley sent to fetch rogiero montenegro has arrived with the news that on the previous night a strong party of men who are believed to have come from padua fell upon the guard and carried off rogiero my sailors came up and fought stoutly but they were overpowered and several of them killed so rogiero is again at large this is a great disappointment to me though the villain is not likely to show his face in the venetian territory again i shall be anxious until maria is safely married and shall lose no time in choosing a husband for her unless i am mistaken her liking is turned in the direction of ruffino brother of your friend matteo gustiani and as i like none better among the suitors for a hand methinks that by the time you return you will find that they are betrothed and now i hear the sailors are heaving the acre and therefore messer hammond it is time we took to our boats there was a parting embrace between francis and his father then the merchants descended into their gondolas and lay waiting alongside until the anchor was up the great sail shaken out and the bonito began to move slowly through the water towards the entrance of the port then with a final wave of the hand the gondolas rode off and francis turned to look at his surroundings the first object that met his eye was giuseppe who was standing near him waving his cap to his father well giuseppe what do you think of this i don't know what i to think yet messer francisco it all seems so big and solid one does not feel as if one was on the water it's more like living in a house it does not seem as if anything could move her you will find the waves can move her about when we get fairly to sea giuseppe and the time will come when you will think our fast gondola was a steady craft in comparison 
How long have you been on board? I came off three hours ago, senor, with the boat that brought the furniture for your cabin. I have been putting that to rights since. A supply of the best wine has been sent off, and extra stores of all sorts, so you need not be afraid of being starved on the voyage. I wish he hadn't sent so much, Francis said. It makes one feel like a milksop. Whose cabin is it that I have got? I believe that it is the cabin usually used by the supercargo, who is in charge of the goods and does the trading. But the men say the captain of the ship has been a great many years in Polani's employment, and often sails without a supercargo being able to manage the trading perfectly well by himself. But the usual cabin is only half the size of yours, and two have been thrown into one to make it light and airy. And where do you sleep, Giuseppe? I'm going to sleep in the passage outside your door, Messer Francisco. Oh, I shan't like that, Francis said. You ought to have a better place than that. Giuseppe laughed. Why, Messer Francisco, considering that half my time I slept in the gondola, and the other half on some straw in our kitchen, I shall do capitally. Of course, I could sleep in the forecastle with the crew if I liked, but I should find it hot and stifling there. I chose the place myself, and asked the captain if I could sleep there, and he has given me leave. In an hour, the Bonito had passed through the Malamoco Channel, and was out on the broad sea. The wind was very light, and but just sufficient to keep the great sails bellied out. The sailors were all at work, coiling down ropes, washing the decks, and making everything clean and tidy. "'This is a good start, Mr. Hammond,' the captain said, coming up to him. "'If this wind holds, we shall be able to make our course round the southern point of Greece, and then on to Candia, which is our first port. I always like a light breeze when I first go out of port.' gives time for everyone to get at home and have things ship shape before we begin to get lively. She does not look as if she would ever get lively, Francis said, looking at the heavy vessel. She is lively enough in a storm, I can tell you, the captain said, laughing. When she once begins to roll, she does it in earnest. But she is a fine sea boat, and I have no fear of gales. I wish I could say as much of pirates. However, she has always been fortunate and as we carry a stout crew, we could give a good account of ourselves against any of the small piratical vessels that swarm among the islands. Although, of course, if she fell in with two or three of them together, it would be awkward. How many men do you carry altogether, Captain? Just seventy. You see, she rows thirty oars, and in case of need, we put two men to each oar. And though she doesn't look fast, she can get along at a fine rate when the oars are double-banked. We have shown them our heels many a time. Our orders are strict. We are never to fight if we can get away by running. But I suppose you have to fight sometimes, Francis said. Yes, I have been in some tough fights several times, though not in the Bonito, which was only built last year. Once in the Lyon we were attacked by three pirates. We were at anchor in a bay, and the wind was blowing on the shore when they suddenly came round the headland. So there was no chance of running, and we had to fight it out. We fought for five hours before they sheared off, pretty well crippled in one of them in flames, for we carried Greek fire. Three or four times they nearly got a footing on deck, but we managed to beat them off somehow. We lost a third of our crew. I don't think there was a man escaped without a wound. I was laid up for three months after I got home with a slash on the shoulder, which pretty nigh took off my left arm. However... We saved the ship and the cargo, which was a valuable one, and Messer Polani saw that no one was the worse for his share in the business. There's no more liberal-hearted man in the trade than he is, and whatever may be the scarcity of hands in the port, there is never any difficulty in getting a good crew together for his vessels. Of course, there are the roughs with the smooths. Some years ago I was in prison for six months with all my crew in Azov. It was the work of those rascally Genoese who are always doing us a bad turn when they have the chance, even when we are at peace with them. They set the mind of the native Khan, that is the prince of the country, against us by some lying stories that we have been engaged in smuggling goods in out of another port. And suddenly, in the middle of the night, in marched his soldiers on board my ship and two other Venetian craft lying in the harbour and took possession of them and shut us all up in prison. There we were till Mr. Polani got news and sent out another ship to pay the fine demanded. 
that was no joke i can tell you for the prison was so hot and crowded and the food so bad we got fever and pretty near half of us died before our ransom came then at constantinople the genoese stirred the people up against us once or twice and all the sailors ashore had to fight for their lives those genoese are always doing us mischief but i suppose you do them mischief sometimes captain i imagine it isn't all on one side of course we pay them out when we get a chance the captain replied it isn't likely we are going to stand being always put upon and not take our chance when it comes we only want fair trade and no favour well those rascals want it all to themselves they know they have no chance with us when it comes to fair trading you know captain that the genoese say just the same about the venetians that the venetians do about them so i expect that there are faults on both sides the captain laughed i suppose each want to have matters their own way messer hammond but i don't consider the genoese have any right to come interfering with us to the eastward of italy they have got france and spain to trade with and all the western parts of italy why don't they keep there besides i look upon them as landsmen why we can always lick them at sea in a fair fight generally captain i admit you generally thrash them still you know they have sometimes got the better of you even when the force was equal the captain grunted he could not deny the fact sometimes our captains don't do their duty he said they put a lot of young patricians in command of the valleys men that don't know one end of a ship from the other and then of course we get the worst of it but i maintain that properly fought a venetian ship is always more than a match for genoese i think she generally is captain and i hope it will always prove so in the future you see though i am english i have lived long enough in venice to feel like a venetian i have never been to england the captain said though a good many venetian ships go there every year they tell me it's an island like venice only a deal bigger than any we have got in the mediterranean those who have been there say the sea is mighty stormy and that sailing up from spain you get tremendous tempests sometimes with the waves ever so much bigger than we have here and longer and more regular but not so trying to the ships as the short sharp gales of these seas i believe that is so captain though i don't know anything about it myself it is some years since i came out and our voyage was a very calm one three days of quiet sailing and the bonito rounded the headlands of the moria and shaped her course to candia the voyage was a very pleasant one to francis each day the captain brought out the list of cargo and instructed him in the prices of each description of goods told him of the various descriptions of merchandise which they would be likely to purchase at the different ports at which they were to touch and the prices which they would probably have to pay for them a certain time too was devoted each day to the examination of the charts of the various ports and islands the captain pointing out the marks which were to be observed on entering and leaving the harbours the best places for anchorage and the points where shelter could be obtained should high winds come on after losing sight of the moria the weather changed clouds banked up rapidly in the southwest and the captain ordered the great sails to be furled we are going to have a serious gale he said to francis which is unusual at this period of the year i have thought for the last two days we were going to have a change but i hope to have reached candia before the gale burst upon us i fear that this will drive us off our course by evening it was blowing hard and the sea got up rapidly the ship speedily justified the remarks of the captain on her power of rolling and, and the oars at which the men had been labouring since the sails were furled were laid in it is impossible to keep our course the captain said we must run up among the islands and anchor under the lee of one of them i should recommend you to get into your bed as soon as possible you have not learned to keep your legs in a storm i see that lad of yours is very ill already but as you show no signs of suffering thus far you will probably escape it was some time however before francis went below the scene was novel to him and he was astonished at the sight of the waves and at the manner in which they tossed the great ship about as if she were an eggshell 
but when it became quite dark, and he could see nothing but the white crests of the waves and the foam that flew high in the air every time the bluff bows of the ship plunged down into a hollow, he took the captain's advice and retired to his cabin. He was on the deck again, early. A gray mist overhung the water. The sea was of a leaden color, crested with white heads. The waves were far higher than they had been on the previous evening, and as they came racing along behind the Bonito, each crest seemed as if it would rise over her stern and overwhelm her. But this apprehension was soon dispelled, as he saw how lightly the vessel rose each time. Although showing but a very small breadth of sail, she was running along at a great rate, leaving a white streak of foam behind her. The captain was standing near the helm, and Francis made his way to him. "'Well, Captain, and how are you getting on, and where are we?' he asked cheerfully. "'We are getting on well enough, Mr. Francisco, as you can see for yourself. The Bonito is as good a sea-boat as ever floated. It would not care for the wind were it twice as strong as it is. It is not the storm I am thinking about, but the islands. If we were down in the Mediterranean, I could turn into my cot and sleep soundly. But here it is another matter. We are somewhere up among the islands, but where no man can say. The wind has shifted a bit two or three times during the night, and as we are obliged to run straight before it, there is no calculating to within a few miles where we are. I have tried to edge out to the westward as much as I could, but with this wind blowing and the height of the ship out of the water, we sag away to leeward so fast that nothing is gained by it. According to my calculations, we cannot be very far from the west coast of Mytilene. If the clouds would but lift and give us a look round for two minutes, we should know all about it, as I know the outline of every island in the Aegean. And as over on this side, you are always in sight of two or three of them. I should know all about it if I could get a view of the land. Now, for aught we know, we may be running straight down upon some rocky coast. The idea was not a pleasant one, and Francis strained his eyes, gazing through the mist. What should we do if we saw land, Captain? he asked presently. Get out the oars. Row her head round and try to work either to the right or the left, whichever point of land seem easiest to weather. Of course, if it was the mainland we were being driven on, there would be no use, and we should try and row into the teeth of the gale so as to keep her off land as long as possible, in hope of the wind dropping. When we got into shallow water, we could drop our anchors and still keep on rowing to lessen the strain upon them. If they gave, there would be an end to the bonito. But if, as I think, we are being driven towards Mytilene, there is a safe harbour on this side of the island, and I shall certainly run into it. It is well sheltered and landlocked. Two more hours passed, and then there was a startling transformation. The clouds broke suddenly and cleared off, as if by magic, and the sun streamed brightly out. The wind was blowing as strong as ever, but the change in the hue of sky and sea would at once have raised the spirits of the tired crew, had not a long line of land been seen stretching ahead of them at a distance of four or five miles. "'Just as I thought!' the captain exclaimed as he saw it. "'That is Mytilene, sure enough, and the entrance to the harbour I spoke of lies away there, on that beam.' The oars were at once got out, the sail braced up a little, and the bonito made for the point indicated by the captain, who himself took the helm. Another half hour, and they were close to land. Francis could see no sign of a port, but in a few minutes the bonito rounded the end of a low island, and a passage opened before her. She passed through this, and found herself in still water, in a harbour large enough to hold the fleet of Venice. The anchor was speedily let drop. It seems almost bewildering, Francis said, the hush and quiet here after the turmoil of the storm outside. To whom does Mytilene belong? The Genoese have a trading station and a castle at the other side of the island, but it belongs to Constantinople. The other side of the island is rich and fertile, but this, as you see, is mountainous and barren. The people have not a very good reputation. 
and if we had been wrecked we should have been plundered if not murdered you see those two vessels lying close to shore near the village they are pirates when they get a chance you may be quite sure in fact these islands swarm with them venice does all she can to keep them down but the Genoese and the Hungarians and the rest of them keep her so busy that she has no time to take the matter properly in hand and make a clean sweep of them. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Lion of St. Mark This is a LibriVox recording. A LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Lion of St. Mark, A Story of Venice in the Fourteenth Century, by G. A. Henty. Chapter 8. An Attack by Pirates. The boat was lowered, and the captain went ashore with a strong crew, all armed to the teeth. Francis accompanied him. The natives were sullen in their manner, but expressed a willingness to trade, and to exchange hides and wine for cloth. "'We may as well do a little barter,' the captain said, as they rowed back towards the ship. "'The port is not often visited, and the road across the island is hilly and rough, so they ought to be willing to sell their goods cheaply.' "'They did not seem pleased to see us, nevertheless,' Francis said. "'No, you see the Genoese have got a footing in the island, and, of course, they represent us to the natives as being robbers, who would take their island if we got the chance. All round these coasts and islands the people are partisans either of Venice or Genoa. They care very little for Constantinople, although they form part of the empire. Constantinople taxes them heavily, and is too weak to afford them protection. Of course they are Greeks, but the Greeks of the islands have very little in common, beyond their language, with the Greeks of Constantinople. They see, too, that the Turks are increasing in power, and they know that, if they are to be saved from falling into the hands of the Moslem, it is Venice or Genoa who will protect them, and not Constantinople, who will have enough to do to defend herself. As to themselves, they would naturally prefer Venice, because Venice is a far better mistress than Genoa, but, of course, when the Genoese get a footing, they spread lies as to our tyranny and greed, and so it comes that the people of the islands are divided in their wishes, and that while we are gladly received in some of them, we are regarded with hate and suspicion in others. Trade at once began, and continued until evening. "'How long do you expect to stay here, Captain?' Francis asked. "'That must depend upon the wind. It may go down tomorrow, it may continue to blow strong for days, and it is no use our attempting to work down to Candia until it changes its direction. I should hope, however, that in a day or two we may be off. We are doing little more than wasting our time here.' A strong watch was placed on deck at nightfall. "'Why, surely, Captain, there is no fear of an attack.' War has not yet been proclaimed with Genoa, although there is little doubt it will be so in a few weeks, or perhaps a few days. There is never a real peace between Venice and Genoa in these seas, the captain said, and as war is now imminent, one cannot be too watchful. State galleys would not be attacked, but merchant vessels are different. Who is to inquire about a merchant ship? Why, if we were attacked and plundered here— who would be any the wiser? We should either have our throats cut or be sent to rot in the dungeons of Genoa, and not till there was an exchange of prisoners, perhaps years hence, would any in Venice know what had befallen us. When weeks passed, and no news came to Venice of our having reached Candia, it would be supposed that we had been lost in the storm. Signor Polani would run his pen through the name of the Bonito, and put her down as a total loss, and there would be an end of it, till those of us who were alive, when the prison doors were opened, made their way back to Venice. No, no, Messer Francisco, in these eastern waters 
one must always act as if the republic were at war why did not antonio doria in a time of profound peace attack and seize eight venetian ships laden with goods killing two of the merchants on board and putting the ships at a ransom as to single vessels missing and never heard of their number is innumerable it is all put down to pirates but trust me the genoese are often at the bottom of it they are robbers the genoese in fair trade we can always beat them and they know it and so they are always seeking a pretext for a quarrel with us francis smiled quietly at the bigoted hatred which the captain bore the genoese but thought it useless to argue with him the next morning he came up on deck soon after daybreak i see one of those vessels has taken her departure he said as he glanced towards the spot where they had been lying so she has the captain said i had not noticed that before i wonder what that fellow has gone for no good you may be sure why it is blowing hard outside still as you may see by the rate those light clouds travel he would never have put to sea without having a motive and he must have had a strong crew on board to row out in the teeth of the gale far enough to make off the land that fellow is up to mischief of some sort a few minutes later the captain ordered a boat to be lowered and rowed out to the rocky islet at the mouth of the harbour and landing climbed up the rocks and looked out to sea in half an hour he returned to the ship it is no use he said to francis the wind is blowing straight into the passage and we could not row the bonito out against it it was different with that craft that went out yesterday evening so i have no doubt she started as soon as it became dark she was low in the water and would not hold the wind besides no doubt they lowered the masts and with a strong crew might well have swept her out but with the bonito with her high sides and heavy tonnage it could not be done what do you think she went out for captain it is likely enough that she may have gone to one of the other islands and may return with a dozen other craft pirates like herself the news that a venetian merchant ship without consorts is weather-bound here would bring them upon us like bees it is a dangerous thing this sailing alone i have talked it over several times with the master other merchants generally send their ships in companies of eight or ten and they are then strong enough to beat off any attack of pirates Messer polani always sends his vessels out singly what he says is this a single ship always travels faster than a convoy because these must go at the rate of the slowest among them then the captain is free to go where he will without consulting others according as he gets news where trade is to be done and when he gets there he can drive his own bargains without the competition of other ships as you see there are advantages both ways the padrone's ships run greater risks but if they get through them safely they bring home much larger profits than do those of others as a rule i prefer sailing singly but just at the present time i should be well pleased to see half a dozen consorts lying alongside three times during the day the captain paid a visit to the rocky island on his return for the last time before nightfall he said to francis the wind is certainly falling i hope that tomorrow morning we shall be able to get out of this trap i am convinced that there is danger you see nothing else do you captain beyond the departure of that craft to make you think that there is danger yes i have seen two things the captain said in the first place the demeanour of the people has changed they do not seem more unfriendly than they were before but as i moved about the place to-day it seemed to me that there was a suppressed excitement people gathered together and talking earnestly and separated if any of our crew happened to go near them even laughed when they thought that none of us were looking and looked serious and sullen if we turned round i am convinced that they are expecting something to happen i have another reason for suspecting it i have kept a sharp watch on that high hill behind the village they tell me there is nothing at the top except some curious stones that look as if they had once been trees so there is nothing they can want to go up for several times to-day 
i have made out the figures of men climbing that hill when they got to the top they stood for some time as if they were looking out over the sea and then came down again without doing anything now men do not climb such a hill as that merely for exercise they went up because they expected to see something and that something could only be a fleet of pirate boats from the other islands i would give a year's pay if we could get out of this place this evening but it cannot be done and we must wait till tomorrow morning i will try then even though i risk being driven on the rocks however if they do come to-night they will not catch us asleep orders were issued that the whole crew were to remain in readiness for attack and that those whose watch was below were to sleep with their arms beside them the lower ports were all closed a strong watch was kept on deck and it was certain that whatever happened the bonito would not be taken by surprise being assured by the captain that it was not probable that any attack would be made before morning as the pirates not knowing their exact position would wait till the first gleam of daylight enabled them to make out where she was lying and to advance in order against her francis lay down on his couch leaving orders that if asleep he was to be called two hours before daybreak he slept but little however getting up frequently and going out to ascertain if any sounds indicated the presence of an enemy upon one of these occasions he found that the person leaning next to him against the bulwark and gazing towards the mouth of the harbour was giuseppe have you been here long giuseppe since you were out last messer francisco i thought i would wait a bit and listen and have you heard anything i have heard sounds several times what sort of sounds giuseppe such a sound as is made when the sails and yards are lowered i have heard it over and over again when out at night on the lagoons near the port there is no mistake in the creaking of the blocks as the halyards run through them i am sure that since i have been here several vessels have brought up inside the mouth of the harbour some of the sailors have heard the same noises so there cannot be any mistake about it if the captain likes i will take a small boat and row out and find out all about them i will ask the captain giuseppe the captain however said there would be no use in this being done whether there are few or whether there are many of them we must wait till morning before we go out there will be no working out that channel in the dark even if we were unopposed but they must have managed to come in francis said no doubt some of their comrades in the other bark or people from the village show a light out there to guide them in besides the wind is favourable to them and against us no young sir there is nothing to do but to wait in the morning if there are but few of them we will try to break through and gain the sea if there are many we will fight here and then all hands will be available for the combat while if we were rowing half of them would be occupied with the oars if your lad were to go as he proposes he might fall into the hands of the enemy and as the information he could gather would be in any case of no use it is best he should remain where he is the hours seemed long until the first tinge of daylight appeared in the sky all hands were on deck now for the news that vessels had been arriving in the port had convinced all that danger really threatened them it was not until half an hour later that they were able to make out some dark objects lying in under the shadow of the islet across the mouth of the harbour there they are messer francisco the captain said ten of them as far as i can make out but there may be more for likely enough some of them are lying side by side there may too be some round a corner where we cannot see them another half hour we shall know all about it francis was half surprised that the captain did not order the oars to be put out and lashed in that position for it was a recognized plan for preventing a ship from being boarded by an enemy who could thus only approach her at the lofty poop and forecastle are you not going to get out the oars to keep them off no messer francisco in the first place our sides are so high out of water that the pirates will have a difficulty in boarding us in any case in the second place if we get the oars out and they row full at them sooner or later they will break them off and it is all important 
that we should be able to row i have been thinking the matter over and my idea is as soon as they advance to get three or four oars at work on either side so as to move her gradually through the water towards the harbour mouth the rowers will be charged to let their oars swing alongside whenever any of their craft dash at them we shall want every oar as well as our sails to get away when we are once outside i do not think we have much chance of finally beating them off if we stop and fight here but if we can do so for a time and can manage to creep out of the harbour all may be well when daylight fairly broke they were able to make out their enemy the vessels were of all sizes from long low craft carrying great sails and long banks of oars down to boats of a few tons burden all seemed crowded with men none of them are anything like as high out of the water as the bonito the captain said and they will find it very difficult to climb up our sides still the odds against us are serious but we shall give them a warmer reception than they expect they will hardly calculate either on our being so strong-handed or so well prepared for them everything was indeed ready for the combat two or three barrels of the compound known as greek fire had been brought up from the hold and the cooks had heated cauldrons full of pitch thirty men with bows and arrows were on the poop and the rest with spears axes and swords stood along the bulwarks we may as well get as near the entrance as we can before the fight begins the captain said get up the anchor and as soon as it is aboard get out four oars on each side the anchor had already been hove short and was soon in its place then the oars dipped into the water and slowly the bonito moved towards the mouth of the harbour scarcely had the oars touched the water than a bustle was perceived on board the piratical ships oars were put out and in two or three minutes the pirates were under way advancing at a rapid pace towards the bonito the crew made no reply to the shouts and yells of the pirates but in accordance with the orders of the captain remained in a stooping position so that the figure of the captain as he hauled up the flag with the lion of venice to the masthead was alone visible to the pirates as these approached volleys of arrows were shot at the bonito but not a shot replied until they were within fifty yards of the ship then the captain gave the word the archers sprang to their feet and from their eminence poured their arrows thick and fast on to the crowded decks of the pirates the captain gave the word to the rowers and they relinquished their oars which swung in by the side of the vessel a moment later two of the largest craft of the pirates dashed alongside the instant they did so they were saluted with showers of boiling pitch while pots full of greek fire were thrown down upon them those who tried to climb up the side of the bonito were speared with lances or cut down with battle-axes the combat was of short duration many of those on whom the boiling pitch had fallen jumped overboard in their agony while others did the same to escape the greek fire which they in vain endeavoured to extinguish the fire quickly spread to the woodwork and in five minutes after the beginning of the fight the two craft dropped astern from the bonito with the flames already rising fiercely from them in the meantime the other vessels had not been idle and a storm of missiles was poured upon the bonito the fate which befell their comrades however showed them how formidable was the vessel they had regarded as an easy prey and when the first assailants of the bonito dropped astern none of the others cared to take their places man the oars again the captain ordered and the bonito again moved forward her crew stooping behind the bulwarks while the archers only rose from time to time to discharge their shafts the thing i am most afraid of the captain said to francis who was standing beside him is that they will ram us with their prows the bonito is strongly built but the chances are that they would knock a hole in her i should think captain that if we were to get up some of those bales of cloth and fasten ropes to them we might lower them over the side and so break the shock it is worth trying anyhow the captain said and a score of the sailors were at once sent down to fetch up the bales 
ropes were fastened around these and they were laid along by the bulwarks in readiness for being lowered instantly ten bales were placed on each side and three men told off to each bale by the time they were halfway to the mouth of the harbor and the preparations were completed just in time for the small boats suddenly drew aside and two of the largest of the pirates craft each rowed by twenty-four oars dashed at her one on each side the captain shouted the order and the men all sprang to their feet it was seen at once that the vessels would both strike about midships three bales on either side were raised to the bulwarks and lowered down with the ropes until close to the water's edge and closely touching each other francis sprang on to the bulwark and superintended the operations on one side while the captain did the same on the other a few more feet astern lads that is right now keep the bales touching you are just in the line an instant later the bonito reeled from the shock of two tremendous blows the bows of the pirates were stove in but the thick bales enabled the bonito to withstand the shock although her sides creaked the seams started and the water flowed in freely but of this the crew thought little they were occupied in hurling darts arrows and combustibles into the pirates as these backed off in an already sinking condition now i think we can go the captain said and ordered the whole of the oars to be manned they were speedily got out and the bonito made her way out through the mouth of the harbor the pirates in their lighter boats rowed round and round her shooting clouds of arrows but not venturing to come to close quarters after the fate which had befallen the four largest vessels of their fleet as soon as they were clear of the islet the sails were hoisted the wind had fallen much during the night and had worked round to the east and under sails and oars the bonito left the island none of the pirates venturing to follow in pursuit the oars were soon laid in and the men with mallets and chisels set to work to caulk the seams through which the water was making its way the casualties were now inquired into and it was found that six men had been shot dead and that nine and twenty had received wounds more or less severe from the arrows of the pirates francis had been twice wounded while superintending the placing of the bales one arrow had gone through his right leg another had struck him in the side and glanced off a rib this won't do messer francisco the captain said as he assisted giuseppe to bandage the wounds signor polani placed you on board to learn something of seamanship and commerce not to make yourself a target for the arrows of pirates however we have to thank you for the saving of the bonito for assuredly she would have been stove in had not the happy thought of hanging those bales overboard struck you it would be of no use against war galleys whose beaks are often below the water-line but against craft like these pirates it acts splendidly and there is no doubt that you saved the ship from destruction and us from death for after the burning of the two first vessels that attacked us you may be sure they would have shown but little mercy i can't think how you came to think of it why i have read it in books captain of defenders of walls hanging over trusses of straw to break the blows of battering rams and machines of the besiegers directly you said they were going to ram us it struck me we might do the same and then i thought that bales of cloth similar to those you got up on deck to trade with the islanders would be just the thing it was a close shave the captain said i was leaning over and saw the whole side of the ship bend beneath the blow and expected to hear the ribs crack beneath me fortunately the bonito was stronger built than her assailants and their bows crumpled in before her side gave but my heart was in my mouth for a time i can tell you so was mine captain i hardly felt these two arrows strike me they must have been shot from one of the other boats then i could not help laughing to see the way in which the men at the oars tumbled backwards at the moment when their vessel struck us it was as if an invisible giant had swept them all off their seats together the wind continued favorable until they arrived at candia where the captain reported to the commander of a venetian war-galley lying in the port the attack that had been made upon him 
and the galley at once started for the scene of the action to destroy any pirates she might find there or among the neighboring islands or in the various inlets and bays of the mainland having delivered their letters and landed a portion of their cargo for the use of polani's agents in the islands the bonito proceeded to cyprus for some weeks she cruised along the coast of syria trading in the various turkish ports for venice although she had shared in some of the crusades was now as she had often been before on friendly terms with the turks her interest all lay in that direction she carried on a large trade with them and in the days when she lay under the interdict of the pope and all europe stood aloof from her she drew her stores of provisions from the moslem ports and was thus enabled successfully to resist the pressure which she suffered from the interdict she foresaw too the growing power of the turks and perceived that in the future they would triumph over the degenerate greek empire at constantinople she had spent her blood and treasure freely in maintaining that empire but the weakness and profligacy of its emperors the intestine quarrels and disturbances which were forever going on and the ingratitude with which she had always treated venice had completely alienated the venetians from her genoa had indeed for many years exercised a far more preponderating influence at constantinople than venice had done having completed the tour of the syrian ports the bonito sailed north with the intention of passing the dardanelles and bosphorus and proceeding to azoff when she reached the little island of tenedos a few miles from the entrance to the strait she heard news which compelled the captain to alter his intentions a revolution had broken out in constantinople aided by the genoese of pera the cruel tyrant calo johannes v had been deposed and his heir andronicus whom he had deprived of sight and thrown into a dungeon released and placed on the throne as a reward for the services she had rendered him andronicus issued a decree conferring tenedos upon genoa the news had just arrived when the bonito entered the port and the town was in a ferment there were two or three venetian warships in the harbor but the venetian admiral being without orders from home as to what part to take in such an emergency remained neutral the matter was however an important one for the possession of tenedos gave its owners the command of the dardanelles and a fleet lying there could effectually block the passage the people thronged up to the governor's house with shouts of down with genoa the governor being unsupported by any greek or genoese troops bowed to the popular will and declared that he did not recognize the revolution that had taken place in constantinople and refused to submit to the decree of andronicus donato trono a venetian merchant resident in the island and other venetians harangued the people and pointed out to them that alone they could not hope to resist the united forces of greece and genoa and that their only hope of safety lay in placing themselves under the protection of venice the people seeing the justice of the arguments of the venetians and preferring the venetian rule to that of genoa agreed to the proposal the banner of st mark was raised amid great enthusiasm and the island declared subject to venice a genoese galley in port immediately set sail and quickly carried the news to constantinople where the emperor at once threw the whole of the venetian residents into prison as soon as the news of this reached tenedos the captain of the bonito held a consultation with francis it is evident messer francisco that we cannot proceed upon our northward voyage we should be captured and held at constantinople and even did we succeed in passing at night we should fall into the hands of the genoese who are far stronger in the black sea than we are for if venice accepts the offer of the people of this place and takes possession of the island genoa is sure to declare war i think then that we had better make our way back to venice with what cargo we have on board and there get fresh orders from the padrone we have not done badly so far and it is better to make sure of what we have got than to risk its loss 
for at any day we may fall in with the Genoese fleet sailing hither. Francis quite agreed with the captain's opinion, and the Bonito sailed for the south. They touched on their way at several islands, and the news that an early outbreak of hostilities between Genoa and Venice was probable, in which case there would be an almost complete cessation of trade, produced so strong a desire on the part of the islanders to lay in a store of goods that the captain was able to dispose of the rest of his cargo on good terms and to fill up his ship with the produce of the islands. Thus the Bonito was deep in the water when she re-entered the port of Venice after an absence of about three months. As soon as the anchor was dropped, the captain, accompanied by Francis, hired a gondola and rowed into the city to give an account to Signor Polani of the success of his voyage and to lay before him a list of the cargo with which the Bonito was laden. The merchant received them with great cordiality and embraced Francis with the affection of a father. "'Do you go at once into this salon, Francisco? You will find my daughters expecting you there, for the news came an hour ago that the Bonito was entering port. Of course we heard from the letters from Candia of your adventures with the pirates, and the gallant way in which the Benito defeated them. You will find, Captain, that I have ordered an extra month's pay to be given to all on board. The Captain did full justice, Francisco, in his account of the matter, to your quickness in suggesting a method by which the effort of the ramming of the enemy was neutralized, and for the courage you showed in carrying out your idea. But we will talk of that afterwards. He and I have business to transact, which will occupy us for some time, so the sooner you go the better. Francis at once took himself off and joined the girls, who received him with the heartiest greeting. We were glad indeed, Francis, Maria said, when our father told us that the Bonito was signaled as entering the port. No letters have come for some time, and we feared that you must have entered the Dardanelles and reached Constantinople before the news arrived there of the affair at Tenedos, in which case you would no doubt have been seized and thrown into the dungeons. We were at Tenedos when the affair took place, Francis said, and have had no opportunity since of sending a letter by any ship likely to be here before us. The outbreak made us alter our plans, for, of course, it would not have been safe to have sailed farther when the emperor was so enraged against Venice. I need hardly tell you I was not sorry when we returned our faces again towards Venice. I have enjoyed the voyage very much, and have had plenty to occupy me. Still, three months at a time is long enough, and I was beginning to long for a sight of Venice. For a sight of Venice and, Maria repeated, holding up her finger reprovingly. And of you both, Francis said, smiling. I did not think it necessary to put that in, because you must know that you are Venice to me. That is much better, Maria said approvingly. I think you have improved since you have been away. Do you not think so, Julia? I don't think that sort of nonsense is an improvement, Julia said gravely. Any of the young Venetian gallants can say that sort of thing. We do not want flattery from Francisco. You should say you do not want it, Julia, Maria said, laughing. I like it. I own, even from Francisco. It may not mean anything, but it is pleasant nevertheless. Besides, one likes to think that there is just a little truth in it, not much, perhaps, but just a little in what Francisco said, for instance. Of course, we are not all Venice to him. Still, just as we are pleased to see him, he is pleased to see us, and why shouldn't he say so in a pretty way? It's all very well for you to set up as being above flattery, Julia, but you are young yet. I have no doubt you will like it when you get as old as I am. Julia shook her head decidedly. I always think, she said, when I hear a man saying flattering things to a girl, that it is the least complimentary thing he can do, for it is treating her as if he considers that she is a fool, otherwise he would never say such outrageous nonsense to her. There, Francisco, Maria laughed, you are fairly warned now. Beware how you venture to pay any compliment to Julia in future. It would be a dull world if everyone were to think as you do, Julia, 
and to say exactly as they meant. Fancy a young man saying to you, I think you are a nice sort of girl, no prettier than the rest, but good-tempered and pleasant, and to be desired because your father is rich. A nice sort of way that would be to be made love to. There is no occasion for them to say anything at all, Julia said indignantly. We don't go about saying to them, I think you are good-looking and well-mannered and witty, or I like you because they say you are a brave soldier and a good swordsman. Why should they say such things to us? I suppose we can tell if anyone likes us without all that nonsense. Perhaps so, the older girl assented, and yet I maintain it's pleasant, and at any rate it's the custom, and as it's the custom we must put up with it. What do you say, Francisco? I don't know anything about it, Francis said. Certainly some of the compliments I have heard paid were barefaced falsehoods, and I have wondered how men could make them, and how women could even affect to believe in them. But on the other hand, I suppose that when people are in love, they really do think the person they are in love with is prettier and more charming, or braver and more handsome than anyone else in the world, and that though it may be flattery, it is really true in the opinion of the person who utters it. And now let us leave the matter alone for the present, Francisco. We are dying to hear all about your adventures, and especially that fight with the pirates. The captain in his letter merely said that you were attacked and beat the pirates off, and that you would have been sunk if it hadn't been that, at your suggestion, they lowered bales of cloth over to break the shock, and that so many men were killed and so many wounded, and that you were hit twice by arrows, but the wounds were healing. That's all he said, for Papa read that portion of his letter out to us. Now we want a full and particular account of the affair. Francis gave a full account of the fight, and then related the other incidents of the voyage. We know many of the ports you touched at, Maria said when he had finished, for when we were little girls, Papa took us sometimes for voyages in his ships, when the times were peaceful and there was no danger. Now let us order a gondola and go for a row. Papa is sure to be occupied for ever so long with your captain. End of chapter 8「Signor Polani told Francis that evening that he was much pleased with the report that the captain had given of his eagerness to acquire information both in mercantile and nautical matters, and of the matter in which he had kept the ship's books and the entries of the sales and purchases of goods. Many young fellows at your age, Francis, when there was no compulsion for them to have taken these matters into their charge, would have thought only of amusement and gaiety when they were in port, and I'm glad to see that you have a real interest in them. Whatever the line in life a young man takes up, he will never excel in it unless he goes into it with all his heart, and I am very glad to see that you have thrown yourself so heartily into your new profession. The Bonita made a most satisfactory voyage, far more so than I anticipated when I found that she would not be able to carry out the program I had laid down for her. But the rise in the prices in the latter part of your voyage have more than made up for the loss of the trade in the Black Sea, and you have done as much in the three months you were absent as I should have expected had you been, as I anticipated, six months away. You will be some little time before you start again, as I wish to see how matters are going before I send the Bonito out upon another adventure. At present, nothing is settled here. That there will be war with Genoa before long is certain, but we would rather postpone it as long as possible, and the Senate has not yet arrived at the decision to accept the offer of Tenedos. Negotiations are going on with Genoa and Constantinople, 
but I have little hope that anything will come of them. It is getting late in the season now, and the war will hardly break out until next spring, but I have no doubt the struggle will then begin, and preparations are going on with all speed in the dockyards. We are endeavouring to obtain allies, but the combination is so strong against Venice that we are meeting with little success, and Ferrara is really the only friend on whom we can rely, and she is not in a position to aid us materially in such a struggle as this will be. I am glad to tell you that the affair in which you were concerned before you sailed has now completely dropped. Nothing has been heard of Mocenigo since he made his escape. A decree of banishment was passed against him, but where he is we know not. That wretched woman was sentenced to four years' imprisonment, but upon my petition she will be released at the end of six months, on her promise that she will not again set foot in the territory of the Republic. As Mocenigo has not been brought to trial, there will be no further official inquiry into the matter, and I have not been further questioned as to the source from which I obtained my information as to the girls' hiding place. Your share in the matter is therefore altogether unsuspected, and I do not think that there is any further danger to you from Mocenigo's partisans. I should be glad enough to remain in Venice a fortnight or so, sir, Francis said, but if, at the end of that time, you have any vessel going out, I shall prefer to go in her. Now that my studies are over, I shall very soon get tired of doing nothing. Perhaps in a few years I may care more for the gaieties of Venice, but certainly at present I have no interest in them, and would rather be at sea. Matteo tells me that you have promised he shall make a few voyages in your ships, and that you have told him he shall go in one of them shortly. If so, it will be very pleasant to us both if we can sail together. I will arrange it so, Francisco. It would be for the benefit of my cousin, who is a good lad but hair-brained and without ballast, for you to go with him. I should indeed have proposed it, but the vessel in which I decided he shall sail will be ready for sea in another ten days or so, and I thought that you would prefer a longer stay in Venice before you again set sail. If, however, it is your wish to be off again so soon, I will arrange for you both to sail together. This time you will go officially as my supercargo, since you now understand the duties. The captain of the vessel in which you will sail is a good sailor and a brave man, but he has no aptitude for trade, and I must have sent a supercargo with him. Your decision to go relieves me of this, for which I am not sorry for men who are at once good supercargoes and honest men are difficult to get. The fortnight passed rapidly, and Francis enjoyed his stay at the merchants greatly, but he was not sorry when at the end of the ten days Polani told him that the lading of the vessel would begin the next day, and that he had best go on board early and see the cargo shipped, so that he might check off the bales and casks as they were sent on board and see where each description of goods was stowed away. I think, Papa, it is too bad of you sending Francisca away so soon, Maria said, when at their evening meal she learnt the news of his early departure. It is his own doing, her father said. It is he who wants to go, not I who send him. I consider that it is entirely your fault. Our fault, the two girls repeated in surprise. Certainly, if you had made Venice sufficiently pleasant to him, he would not wish to leave. I am too busy to see about such things, and I left it to you to entertain him. As he is in such a hurry to get away again, it is evident that you have not succeeded in doing so. Indeed, Signor Polani, your daughters have been everything that is kind, but I have no taste for assemblies and entertainments. I feel out of place there, amid all the gaily dressed nobles and ladies, and no sooner do I get there than I begin to wonder how anyone can prefer the heated rooms and clatter of tongues to the quiet pleasure of a walk backwards and forwards on the deck of a good ship. Besides, I want to learn my profession, and there is so much to learn in it that I feel I have no time to lose. I am right glad to see your eagerness in that direction, Francisco, and I did but jest with my daughters. You have not yet asked me what is the destination of the Lido, for that is the name of your new vessel. This time you are going quite in a new direction. 
in the spring we are certain to have war with genoa and as palma and hungary will probably both take side against us we may find ourselves cut off from the mainland and in case of a disaster happening to our fleet in sore straits for food i am therefore going to gather into my warehouses as much grain as they will hold this will both be a benefit to the state and will bring me good profit for the price of wheat will be high in the city if we are leaguered on the land side the lido will go down to sicily and fill up there with corn you will have to use care before entering port for with war now certain both parties will begin to snap up prizes when they get the chance so you must keep a sharp lookout for genoese galleys if you find the coast is too closely watched you will go to the moorish ports we are friends with them at present though doubtless as soon as genoa and ourselves get to blows they will be resuming their piratical work thus you will this time take in a much smaller amount of cargo as you will have to pay for the most part in gold it mattered little to francis where he voyaged but matteo who had been greatly delighted at the thought of sailing with his friend was much disappointed when he heard that they were only going to fetch grain from sicily why it is nothing to call a voyage he said in tones of disgust when francis told him the destination of the lido i had hoped we were going to make a long voyage and touch at all sorts of places just as you did last time i do not see that it matters much matteo and we shall learn navigation just as well from one course as another the voyage will not be a long one unless we meet with unfavourable winds but there's no saying what may happen and you may meet with adventure even on a voyage to sicily and back the trip down to sicily was quickly made francis had worked hard on his first voyage and was now able to make daily calculations as to the run made the course steered and the position of the ship and found that these tallied closely with those of the captain matteo and he shared a large and handsome cabin and the time passed pleasantly as the vessel ran down the coast of italy once out of the adriatic a sharp lookout was kept but the coast of sicily was made without seeing any sails of a suspicious character the lads were struck with surprise and admiration when on coming on deck in the morning they saw the great cone of etna lying ahead of them neither of them had ever seen a mountain of any size and their interest in the scene was heightened by a slight wreath of smoke which curled up from the summit of the hill it is well worth a voyage if it were only to see that mountain francis said what an immense height it is and how regular in its shape and yet matteo said those who have journeyed from italy into france tell me that there are mountains there beside which etna is as nothing these mountains are a continuation of the range of hills which we can see from venice their tops are always covered with snow and cannot be ascended by man whereas it is easy they say to reach the top of etna yes that looks easy enough francis agreed it seems such a regular slope that one could almost ride up but i dare say when you are close you would find all sorts of difficult places i should like to try matteo said what a grand view there would be from the top is the port we are going to try first captain anywhere near the foot of the mountain no i am going round the southern part of the island on this side the ground is less fertile and we should have difficulty in obtaining a cargo but even were we to put into a port on this side you would not be able to climb mount etna sicily has been an unfortunate country its great natural wealth has rendered it an object of desire to all its neighbours it was the battleground of the romans and carthaginians pisa genoa and naples have all contended for its possession and the moors frequently made descents upon its coasts it has seldom enjoyed a peaceful and settled government the consequence is that general lawlessness prevails in the districts remote from the towns while in the forests that clothe the side of Mount Etna, there are numerous hordes of bandits who set the authorities at defiance, levy blackmail throughout the surrounding villages, and carry off wealthy inhabitants and put them to ransom. No one in his senses would think of ascending that mountain, unless he had something like an army with him. I should like to try it all the same, Matteo asserted. 
if there are woods all over it it is not likely one would happen to meet with any of these people i should like above all things to get to the top of that hill it would be harder work than you think young sir the captain said you have no idea from this distance what the height is or what a long journey it is to ascend to the top i have been told that it is a hundred and twenty miles round its foot i don't think you would like it matteo if you were to try it francis said laughing you know you are as lazy as you can be and hate exerting yourself i am sure that before you got a quarter the distance up that mountain you would have only one wish and that would be to be at the bottom again i don't know matteo said i hate exerting myself uselessly wasting my strength as you do in rowing at an oar or anything of that sort but to do anything great i would not mind exertion and would go on until i dropped that is all very well matteo but to do anything great you have got to do small things first you could never wield a sword for five minutes unless you had practised with it and you will never succeed in accomplishing any feats requiring great strength and endurance if you do not practise your muscles on every occasion you used to grumble at the height when you came up to my room in the old house and i suppose etna is something like two hundred times as high that does sound a serious undertaking matteo said laughing and i'm afraid that i shall never see the view from the top of etna certainly i shall not if it will be necessary beforehand to be always exercising my muscles by running up the stairs of high houses the next day they were off girgenti the port at which they hoped to obtain a cargo they steered in until they encountered a fishing boat and learned from those on board that there was no genoese vessel in port nor as far as the men knew any state galleys anywhere in the neighbourhood obtaining this news they sailed boldly into the port and dropped anchor francis who had received before starting a list of houses with whom signor polani was in the habit of doing business at once rowed ashore matteo and giuseppe accompanying him his business arrangements were soon completed the harvest had been a good one and there was an abundance of corn to be had at a cheap rate in half an hour he arranged for as large a quantity as the leader would carry the work of loading soon commenced and in four days the ship was full up to the hatches francis went on shore to settle the various accounts and was just making the last payment when matteo ran into the office four genoese galleys are entering the bay francis ran out and saw four genoese galleys rowing in it is too late to escape even were we empty we could not get away but laden as the lido is they could row three feet to her one what shall we do francisco francis stood for half a minute thinking you had better stay here matteo i will row out to the ship and send most of the men on shore if they seize the ship they may not take those on board prisoners but if they do there is no reason why they should take us all you had better come on shore too francisco and leave the captain in charge you can do no good by staying there and polani would be more concerned at your capture than he would at a loss of a dozen ships if you could do any good it would be different but as it is it would be foolish to risk capture i will see francis said at any rate do you stop here jumping into a boat he rowed towards the lido which was lying but a cable's length from the shore as he neared her he shouted to the men to lower the boats captain he said i do not know whether there is any danger of being captured by the genoese but it is useless to run any unnecessary risk therefore send all the crew but three or four men on shore if the genoese board us we have our papers as peaceful traders buying wheat but if in spite of that they capture us we must take our chance surely you are not thinking of stopping messer francesco the padrone would be terribly vexed if you were taken he specially ordered me before we started to see that no unnecessary risk was run and to prevent you from thrusting yourself into danger therefore as captain of the ship i must insist that you go on shore i think i ought to stay here francis said i do not think so the captain said firmly and i will not suffer it 
I have to answer for your safety to the padrone, and if you do not go by yourself, I shall order the men to put you into one of the boats by force. I mean no disrespect, but I know my duty, and that is to prevent you from falling into the hands of the Genoese. I will not oblige you to use force, Captain, Francis said, smiling, and will do as you wish me. In five minutes the men were all, save four, whom the captain had selected, in the boat and rowing towards shore. Matteo was awaiting them when they landed. That is right, Francisco. I was half afraid you would stay on board. I know how obstinate you are whenever you take a thing into your head. The captain was more obstinate still, Matteo, and said that unless I came away he would send me on shore by force. But I don't like deserting the ship. That is nonsense, Francisco. If the Genoese take her, they take her, and your remaining on board could not do any good. What are you going to do now? We will at once leave the place with the men, Matteo, and retire into the country behind. It is not likely the Genoese would land and seize us here, but they might do so. Or the inhabitants, to please Genoa, might seize us and send us on board. At any rate, we shall be safer in the country. The men had, by the captain's orders, brought their arms ashore on leaving the ship. This was the suggestion of Francis, who said that, were they unarmed, the people might seize them and hand them over to the Genoese. At the head of this party, which was about fifty strong, Francis marched up through the little town and out into the country. He had really but little fear, either that the Genoese would arrest them on shore, or that the people would interfere with them for they would not care to risk the anger of Venice by interfering in such a matter. He thought it probable, however, that if his men remained in the town, broils would arise between them and any of the Genoese sailors who might land. As soon as the Genoese galleys came up to the head of the bay, a boat was lowered and rowed to the Lido, at whose masthead the Venetian flag was flying. An officer, followed by six men, climbed up onto the deck, are you the captain of this ship? the officer asked as the captain approached him. I am, the captain said. What ship is it? It is the Lido, the property of Messer Polani, a merchant of Venice, and laden with a cargo of wheat. Then you are my prisoner, the Genoese said. I seize this vessel as lawful prize. There is peace between the republics, the captain said. I protest against the seizure of this ship as an act of piracy. We have news that several of our ships have been seized by the Venetians, the officer said, and we therefore capture this vessel in reprisal. Where are your crew? There are only four on board, the captain said. We have filled up our cargo and we're going to sail tomorrow, and therefore the rest of the crew were allowed to go on shore, and I do not think it is likely that they will return now for one of the Genoese sailors had hauled down the flag of Venice and had replaced it with that of Genoa. The Genoese officer briefly examined the vessel. Whom have you here on board with you? he asked, struck by the furniture and fittings of Francis's cabin. This is the cabin of Matteo Giustiniani, a young noble of Venice who is making his first voyage in order to fit himself for entering the service of the state and of Francisco Hammond, who stands high in the affection of my patron. The Genoese uttered an angry exclamation. The name of Polani was well known in Genoa, as one of the chief merchants of Venice, and as belonging to a ducal house, while the family of Giustiniani was even more illustrious, and had these passengers fallen into his hands, a ransom might have been obtained greatly exceeding the value of the Lido and her cargo. Leaving four of his men on board, he went off to the galley of the officer commanding the fleet and presently returned with a large boat full of sailors. You and your men can go ashore, he said to the captain. The admiral does not deem you worth the trouble of carrying to Genoa, but be quick or you will have to swim to shore. As the leader's boats had all gone ashore, the captain hailed a fishing boat which was passing, and with the four sailors was rowed to shore well content that he had escaped the dungeons of Genoa. He rightly imagined that he and his men were released solely on the account of the paucity of their numbers. Had the whole crew been captured, 
they would have been carried to Genoa, but the admiral did not care to bring in five prisoners only and preferred taking the ship alone. Francis, with his party, followed the line of the coast, ascending the hills which rose steeply from the edge of the sea at a short distance from the town. He had brought with him from the town a supply of food sufficient for four or five days and encamped in a little wood near the edge of the cliff. From this they had the view of the port and could watch the doings of the Genoese galleys. Fires were lit and meat cooked over them, and just as the meal was prepared the captain and the four sailors joined them, amid a hearty cheer from the crew. I have made my protest, the captain said as he took his seat by the side of Francis, and the padrone can make a complaint before the council if he thinks fit to do so. But there is small chance that he will ever recover the Lido or the value of her cargo. I don't like losing the ship, Francis said. Of course, it is only a stroke of bad fortune, and we could neither fly nor defend ourselves. Still one hates arriving home with the story that one has lost the ship. Yes, the captain agreed. Messer Polani is just a man, yet no one cares to employ men who are unlucky. And the worst of it is that the last ship I commanded was wrecked. Many men would not have employed me again, although it wasn't my fault. But after the second affair, in a few months' time, I shall get the name of being an unlucky man, and no one in his senses would employ a man who is always losing his ships. Do you think that there is any chance of our recapturing it, Captain? Not the least in the world, the captain replied. Even supposing that we could get on board and overpower the Genoese without being heard and get her out of the port without being seen, we should not get away. Laden as she is with grain, she will sail very slowly and the Genoese would overtake her in a few hours. And I needn't tell you that then there would be very little mercy shown to any on board. That is true enough, Francis said. Still, I do not like the idea of losing the Lido. After the meal was over, Francis rose and asked Matteo to accompany him on a stroll along the cliffs, Giuseppe, as usual, following them. They walked along until they rounded the head of the bay and were able to look along the coast for some distance. It was steep and rocky and worn into a number of slight indentations. In one of these rose a ledge of rocks at a very short distance from the shore. How much further are we going, Francis? Matteo said, when they had walked a couple of miles. About a quarter of a mile, Matteo. I want to examine that ledge of rocks we saw from the first point. What on earth do you want to look at them for, Francis? You certainly are the most curious fellow I ever met. You scoffed at me when I said I should like to go up Mount Etna, and now here you are, dragging me along this cliff, just to look at some rocks of no possible interest to anyone. That is the point to be inquired into, Matteo. I think it's possible they may prove very interesting. Matteo shrugged his shoulders, as he often did when he felt too lazy to combat the eccentric ideas of his English friend. There we are, Francis said at last, standing on the edge of the cliff and looking down. Nothing could be better. I am glad you think so, Francisco, Matteo said, seating himself on the grass. I hope you intend to stay some little time to admire them, for I own that I should like a rest before I go back. Francis stood looking at the rocks. The bay was a shallow one, and was about five or six hundred yards from point to point, the rocks rising nearly in a line between the points, and showing for about two hundred yards above water, and at about the same distance from the cliffs behind them. What height do you think those rocks are above the water, Giuseppe? It is difficult to judge, signor. We are so high above them. But I should think in the middle they must be ten or twelve feet. I should think it likely they were more than double that, Giuseppe. But we shall see better when we get down to the bottom. I dare say we shall find a place where we can clamper down somewhere. My dear Francisco, Matteo said earnestly, is anything the matter with you? I begin to have doubts of your sanity. What on earth do these rocks matter to you, one way or the other? Or what can you care whether they are thirty inches or thirty feet above the water? 
they do not differ from other rocks as far as i can see they are very rugged and very rough and would be very awkward if they lay out at sea instead of in this little bay where they are in nobody's way is it not enough that you have tramped two miles to have a look at them which means four miles as we have got to return somehow and now you talk about climbing down that breakneck cliff to have a look at them close but francis paid no attention to mattel's words he was gazing down into the clear smooth water which was so transparent that every stone and pebble at the bottom could be seen the water looks extremely shallow giuseppe what do you think it seems to me signor that there is not a foot of water between the rocks and the shore it does look so giuseppe but it is possible that the transparency of the water deceives us and that there may be ten or twelve feet of water there however that is what we must go down and find out now the first thing is to look about and find some point at which we can get down to the beach well i will lie down and take a nap till you come back mattel said in a tone of resignation i have no interest either in these rocks or in the water and as far as i can protest i do so against the whole proceeding which to me savours of madness don't you understand you silly fellow what i am thinking about francis said impatiently not in the smallest degree francisco but do not trouble to tell me it makes no matter you have some idea in your head carry it out by all means only don't ask me to cut my hands tear my clothes and put myself into perspiration by climbing down that cliff my idea is this matteo there is no chance of carrying off the lido by speed from the genoese but if we could get her out of the bay we might bring her round here and lay her behind those rocks and the genoese would pass by without dreaming she was there half a mile out those rocks would look as if they formed part of the cliff and none would suspect there was a passage behind them that is something like an idea matteo said jumping to his feet why did you not tell me of it before you have quite alarmed me seriously i began to think that you had become a little mad and was wondering whether i had not better go back and fetch the captain and some of his men to look after you now let us look at your rocks again why man there is not enough water to float a boat between them and the shore much less the lido which draws nine foot of water now she is loaded i don't know matteo looking down on water from a height is very deceiving if it is clear and transparent there is nothing to enable you to judge its depth at any rate it is worth trying before we go down we will cut some long stiff rods with which we can measure the depth but we have first to find a place where we can get down to the water after a quarter of an hour's search they found a point where the descent seemed practicable a little stream had worn a deep fissure in the face of the rock shrubs and bushes had grown up in the crevices and afforded a hold for the hands and there appeared no great difficulty in getting down before starting they cut three stiff slender rods twelve feet in length they then set to work to make the descent it was by no means difficult and in a few minutes they stood by the edge of the water it is a great advantage the path being so easy francis said for in case they did discover the ship we could land and climb to the top before they had time to come to shore and once there we could keep the whole force in those galleys at bay now for the main point the depth of the water matteo shook his head it is useless to take the trouble to undress francis he said as the latter threw off his jacket giuseppe can wade out to the rocks without wetting his knees giuseppe can try if he likes francis said but i will wager he will not get far giuseppe as convinced as matteo of the shallowness of the water stepped into it but was surprised to find that before he had gone many paces the water was up to his waist well i wouldn't have believed it if i hadn't seen it matteo said when he returned but i think he must have got stuck in a deep hole among the rocks however we shall soon see and he too began to undress in a few minutes the three lads were swimming out towards the rocks which as francis had anticipated rose from twenty to thirty feet above the level of the sea the water deepened fast 
and for the last thirty or forty yards they were unable to touch the bottom even when thrusting down their rods to the fullest depth they then tried the depth in the passages at the end of the rocks and found that there was ample water for the lido when they ascertained this to their satisfaction they swam back to the shore i shall believe you in future francis even if you assert that the moon is made of cheese i could have taken an oath that there was not a foot of water between those rocks and the shore i hardly ventured to hope that it was as deep as it is francis said but i know how deceiving clear water is when you look down upon it from a height however that point is settled but they would see our masts above the rocks francisco they are sure to keep a sharp lookout as they go along we must take the masts out of her francis said i don't know how it is to be done but the captain will know and if that can't be managed we must cut them down there is no difficulty about that now we will make our way back again it will be dark in a couple of hours time everything depends upon whether they have towed the lido out and anchored her among their galleys if they have i fear the scheme is impracticable but if they let her remain where she is lying we might get her out without being noticed for there is no moon as they began to ascend the cliff francis stopped suddenly we should never be able to find this place in the dark he said giuseppe you must stay here do you collect a quantity of dried sticks and lay them in readiness at that point opposite the ledge we will show a light as we come along that is if we succeed in getting the lido out and directly you see it set fire to the sticks the fire will be a guide to us as to the position of the rocks perhaps i better take the sticks off to the ledge messer francisco and light my fire on the rock at the end the water is deep a few yards out as we found so you could sail close to the fire and then round behind the rocks without danger that will be the best way giuseppe but how will you get the sticks off without wetting them i will make a bundle three or four times as big as i want giuseppe said and then half of them will be dry i can put my clothes on them and the tinder i will answer for the fire but i would rather have been with you in your adventure there will be no danger there giuseppe so you need not be anxious about us it has to be done quietly and secretly and there will be no fighting these genoese are too strong to think of that and if we are discovered in the attempt or as we make off we shall take our boats again and row straight on shore keep a sharp lookout for us we will hoist two lights one above the other to prevent you mistaking any fishing boat which may be coming along for us now matteo for a climb we have no time to lose the two lads climbed to the top of the cliff and then started at brisk pace along the top and in half an hour reached the wood we were beginning to wonder what had become of you the captain said as they joined him we have been settling how to carry off the lido francis said and have arranged everything the captain laughed if we could fly with her through the air you might get her away but i see no other way i have been thinking it over since you left with luck we might get her safely out of the bay but the galleys row four feet to our one and as they would be sure to send some one way and some the other along the coast they would pick us up again in two or three hours after daylight nevertheless we have settled it captain we have found a place where we can hide her and the genoese might search the coast for a month without finding her if that be so it is possible the captain said eagerly and you may be sure you will not find us backwards in doing our best francis described the nature and position of the rock which would afford a shelter and the means by which they had ascertained that there was plenty of water for the lido behind it it seems plausible the captain said when he had concluded and i am quite ready to make the attempt if in your opinion it can be done you are Monsieur polani's representative and for my own sake as well as his i would do anything which promises a chance of recapturing the ship besides as you say there is little danger in it for we can take to the boats and make for the shore if discovered the lido is still lying where we anchored her they can have no fear of a recapture for they would know that they could overtake us easily enough 
I dare say they intend to sail tomorrow morning, and did not think it worth the trouble to get up the anchor and tow her out to where they are lying. The details of the expedition were now discussed and arranged, and the men told off to their various duties, and at eleven o'clock at night, when all in the town were fast asleep, the party quitted the bivouac and marched down again to the port. End of chapter 9